say I thought that uh, that Tom was the vice chair, but under further review, you're the vice chair. Yes, I remember that. Okay, I didn't, um, but Michael did. So when we get to item number five, I'm going to have you uh, do that item on the meeting. Oh. <laughs> okay, I haven't been trained in in, uh, but I'll do the best I can. Rodney, I'll help you. He, All right, he'll do. He'll do fine. He promised me he would help you. <laughs> All right, I'll hold him to it. All right. <clears throat> So yeah, so Tom, we looked it up and actually Todd was the vice chair this last time around. All right, works so, for me. All right, so it looks like we're ready. Uh, we'll begin the meeting. It is Monday, March 8th of 2021. This is the Stoughton Plan Commission meeting. We do have a quorum. Uh, so the first item for consideration are the minutes from February 8th and February 24th, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make so And is there a second? Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Anybody like anything removed or voted on separately? There are none. All in favor of the minutes, say aye. 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 And any opposed? That motion carries. Item number three is the council representative report. All the person Caravello, anything to report out tonight? Um, well, first thing is, I want to verify that you guys can hear me. We can. Okay, okay. cool. I, my, I have to get my Something is funny with my computer, so I'm calling in again, but I'm I'm visually on my computer, but I need to get something figured out. But yes, there are three things to report. Um, at the February 9th council meeting, 04 of 2021 was approved, and at the February 23rd council meeting, R22 and R23 of 2021 were both approved. And that's it. All right, thank you. And staff reports? Yeah, so the status of kind of current development projects that are underway is included in your packet. I don't think there's anything of particular importance to highlight other than we'll be seeing the Kettle Park West final plat for the outlot replatting area, um, likely at the next plan commission meeting, likely in April. All right, any questions for staff? All right, we'll take this item number five and I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Commissioner Barman for this one item. All right, thank you, Mayor. So I, item number five is a request by Danny Semp representing Pizza Hut for approval of a conditional use permit for indoor commercial entertainment and in vehicle sales and service uses, including a site plan approval at 1400 US Highway 51 at 138. Um, so that's the former, I think most recently was Mike Subs, is that correct? It's, it's been vacant for a number of years, but it's the, the building in front of the Viking Lanes bowling alley. The aerial is on your screen now. All right. Do you want to walk us through the proposal or is Danny Semp online? Sure. I'm online. I'll just, yeah, give right a right quick, on. I'll just give a quick overview. Um, as most will realize, this building has sat vacant for a number of years. Um, the Pizza Hut organization owns this facility. They're looking at relocating their operation to this smaller footprint building with the drive through facility and services offered here. Um, as we know, it was a restaurant with a drive through facility in, in recent, not in recent past, but in the past when it was open, that was one of the several restaurants that were located at this facility. Um, as part of this, there will be a public hearing related to the conditional use aspect of it for the indoor um, commercial entertainment services and drive through facility. 
Secondarily, there's a resolution that will be acted on separately related to the site plan for the facility. All right, Rodney, would it be more appropriate to hear from um, Danny uh, before we go into the public hearing or after? I, th I certainly think it'd be fine to get an overview from the applicant up front before the public hearing opens. All right, Danny, are you able to walk us through it? You bet. <clears throat> we currently uh, occupy the building directly across the street. And one, our dine-in business has decreased each year for the last 10 years. Uh, we have 40 some locations and we find that to be the case in all of them. Uh, people just don't go out to eat at least in our uh, product line as much as they used to. So uh, the building that we occupy now is uh, way oversized. It's a high overhead. And when COVID hit and we had no dining customers at all, it phenomenally affected our sales. Fortunately, we've been able to maintain uh, operation and at least break even with our delivery and carry out service. Uh, we have on a number of other locations installed pickup windows in a facility similar as the one that we currently occupy. And we've monitored the results of that and we find that eight out of 10 customers prefer to go to the pickup window instead of coming in the store and purchasing the product. Uh, we feel that it's been a uh, effective way to control interaction with the customer as it relates to COVID. It's much safer for both the customer and our employees. So because the uh, investment group that owns the current building owns the building that we want to remodel, uh, we've decided that we'd like to move into that location, reduce our overhead, it has a current pickup window, pickup lane. It meets all the code requirements to my knowledge. Uh, and that's the main reason for relocating. Uh, we will obviously uh, change some of the exterior decor. There was a, a complete architectural package that was submitted. I'm, I'm assuming everybody received that. Uh, so it'll have a complete facelift inside and out. We're gonna replace the HVAC equipment a uh, new walk-in cooler, freezer. It'll be basically a remodel, but when we're done, it'll be like new. Any Great. questions that I can answer? I, I think we'll hold questions and, and, and go into the public hearing first and see what, um, see if we have anybody who's gonna be speaking um, and then we'll bring it back into the commission. So. Um, unless someone wants to advise me otherwise, I, I think we should probably close um, the commission meeting, open the public hearing. Correct. And then, Rodney, is anyone uh, registered to speak or, or ask questions? No one has res registered in advance, but I think you'd normally be open to questions or comments if there are any. Are there any questions or comments from people online? Going once, going twice. All right. I'm having no comments um, or questions. We'll close the public hearing and reopen the commission meeting. Um, any questions on the conditional use permit portion of this proposal? Uh, from the commission members. I had two uh, related to the conditional use. Um, I guess more so um, about the the proposed building on there when I was looking at the the actual photograph of it. Um, I know the ar architectural drawing on it is going to be not inclusive of everything that's in there. I was curious about um, whether the two large trees that are in there were going to be kept. I mean, they look like they kind of overhang the building in a in a, an unusual way anyway. At least one of them, uh, I guess the one that would be to the west and then the one that would be south of the building. 
they whether are, those would be maintained. Currently plan, they're currently planned to remain. Uh, we plan on pruning them up. And in order to meet the uh, landscape requirements, uh, actually, we're going to be adding a lot of plantings, including a few more trees. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious about that. Um, and then uh, what would what would become of the original building that you would be not vacating? But I mean, I know you'd still maintain ownership of it, but uh, did you have any ideas about what that might become or if that would go up for sale or any of the above? Any of the above. Uh, the requirement by corporate Pizza Hut out of Dallas is that we de-identify the building. Uh, that de-identification basically means that we have to take the cupola off the roof and put a new roof on it because people identify Pizza Hut with that roof line. Uh, so okay. that would be part of the de-identification process. And then uh, we would either entertain subletting it should someone be interested in that or selling the property. Okay, all right. Um, then I have one that is sort of on the lines of the conditional use, but uh, maybe a little bit outside of it. Um, in, in your uh, overview of it, you were talking about uh, that all 40 restaurants that, that you represent in there, uh, we're seeing a decline in this, in the dine-in business. Um, is that also reflected in the in the carry out and and delivery portion of it uh, basically is is the pizza hut brand declining or is this a larger indicator of the just the economic condition the dining business positively has declined in all of our locations however our carry out and delivery service in some stores is up 40 percent Okay. So we're, and, and quite honestly, uh, it's more profitable because we don't have the overhead, the wait staff, uh, the buffet and salad bar. Uh, we had high food costs by limiting to the delivery slash carryout business. Our volumes have decreased because of the lack of dining sales, but our bottom line has actually increased. Okay. Um, those are the questions I had. Thank you. You bet. So, um, before I entertain a motion, I, I would say the conditional use permit here seems pretty straightforward, largely because the use that was in that building prior was um, similar in terms of um, restaurant, food production, as well as drive through. So, um, any other comments or questions before I entertain a motion? All right, then I'll entertain a motion. I'll make the motion, Todd. All right, so we have a motion to approve the conditional use permit um, for 1400 US Highway 51 138. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Any other any other comments or questions before we vote? Just one clarification that this is actually a recommendation to the city council for the CUP. Perfect. Thank you. So all in favor of recommending this to council for approval, say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion carries. I'm an aye as well. All right, so then we move on to the site plan. Um, and we've, we've touched on the site plan to some extent, but I, I think I would like uh, just to, if staff could talk a little bit more about a couple of issues that I think they identified in our packet, um, which was one, it, it seems to me that um, they, the proposal might be under the amount of green space based on current codes, um, but I don't know if they're grandfathered in. It sounds like we were I think if I remember right, it was 16% coverage in the proposal and 25% is what normally is required. So if staff could talk a little bit more about that. Um, plus, I would like a little bit of conversation about the 23 existing parking stalls um, that are identified. I'm assuming that 
the the um, if we can go to the yes that that particular document the all the the, the stalls on the right hand side of that particular plan document are for the Viking lanes and we must split the ones the parking the ink the parallel parking that's upon the top or the perpendicular parking I should say that the the 23 stalls are the ones just to the immediate south of the building and to the west of the building until we hit 23. So if we can just get clarification on that. Yeah, actually the stalls to the north of the facility, so shown on the right side of the screen here by the dumpster enclosure, okay. those are actually part of this particular parcel. So Correct. on the west side of the access aisle, uh, coming into the facility there is not part of this particular site. So the, the parking stalls just to the north of the property or north of the building and to the south of the building are part of this facility's property and accommodating the parking requirements for this, this building. Ah, okay. All right, so then the ones to the west, are those just overflow parking for Viking lanes? Those are, yep, those are related to Viking lanes. That, so could they be used? I'm sure they may be in some cases, but they're, they're certainly part of the Viking lanes parking parking facility. Okay, and then the dumpster in this particular drawing, um, again, to the north or the right of our piece of paper there, um, that is for the, the the property in question. Correct. Okay. And then, then how about the, Go ahead. the landscape requirements then? Yeah, as you can see, there really is not any physical change being made to the site. Um, other than other than the actual dumpster enclosure, um, so it, it becomes difficult to evaluate whether there there is a requirement that we can force additional area to be um, made impervious as a result of this, because uh, there is not really any alterations to the parking and or drive through configuration uh, as part of this plan. All right. Thank you. So I'll open it up to um, questions from the commission. Rodney, do uh, between this this lot where the the building is located and those additional parking stalls on there, is there a, uh, a parking surface agreement between those two property owners as far as if that entire parking lot were to be uh, resurfaced? There is an ingress egress easement that's actually uh, shown on your screen now um, was supplied. So there is a, actually an agreement that allows for that, the utilization of that area. I'm sorry, maybe it's not showing up on your screen properly yet, um, but this was provided to document the easement to allow for cross, crossing the property to get to the parking stalls in another part of this facility. Okay, um, with the, uh, or uh, those additional parking spaces to the on the north side of that building, will those be uh, delineated in some different way to that those should be for uh, the Pizza Hut customers use only or I worry that people might can might uh, overrun those parking places if there's a, a bowling league night or something like that. Yeah, I don't know if the pizza rep representative has something to say about it. I'm certain that there's going to be some cross sharing of parking stalls in that location, as well as the, the Viking lanes parking along the west edge of the paved surface as well. Exactly. It, it's right now. Uh, it's a gentleman's agreement. Uh, okay. I contacted uh, the bowling alley and, and they feel that's adequate. Uh, and obviously we do. Okay. Yeah, I mean, as long as both property owners are in agreement on it, then then that's good. We are. Um, is there the potential? I, I know um, we're kind of on, as Roddy had mentioned, we're on the fence here in terms of whether the landscape requirement is grandfathered or whether we could ask you to have a little bit more impervious or green space. Um, there is a lot of, of pavement in this particular site. 
um, in, in your when you're going through and working on your landscape plan and, and your development plans did you consider adding more green space I I don't know where we would get it from uh, unless we took it from parking down below which doesn't uh, really improve the site because it's basically out of view there's an elevation change right at the edge of the drive lane on the north side and there's stairs going down into that lower parking area uh, I, I just don't know where we would put it we've we've used every inch of green space we we had available yes um, we, we would have to remove either ice asphalt or concrete the the places i mean again i haven't had a chance to um you know do a new site plan but the the places i i look at where it might make some sense um would be is as you pull into the drive from the uh, off of uh, main street the first few stalls that are the perpendicular stalls to the west um where you're kind of um, across from the the um, drive through area. Um, the, so they're in the upper uh, southwest corner of your property. The okay. first, the first two, three stalls there. Um, if you added more green space there, it might make an attractive, more attractive entry um, and, and maybe a, a sign backdrop or a sign place, but depending on how things look in terms of sight lines and everything else. But those those particular stalls there are, are very far removed from Viking Lane in terms of overflow. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Is that part of your property? Yes. No. I, I think I think as I understood where you you described, um, Commissioner Barman would actually be on the Viking Lanes property if I'm recognizing uh, you correct. It'd be on the top of the page as shown right now, and I I understand that to be the Viking Lanes property. I got you. Yeah. Across that 65 foot entrance where that parking starts is the 65 feet is the easement and then those parking stalls and that knoll that goes up to our property is part of the Viking Lane property. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were talking about where we're showing a tree now right there at the uh, south west south. property line, oh. our property line. I gotcha. Yes. It's, excuse me. Could somebody explain to me then where is then your map is confusing because what I'm seeing that you're showing as a site map, everything on that should belong to this property, correct? But it's not? No. I think this illustration might be a little easier to, to show. This aerial the map. Yellow line? The yellow line is the perimeter of the parcel in question. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry for confusing it. The other, the other site plan was a different orientation, but from south to north, they have the parking stalls north of the building and south of the building. And as shown on the west side of the building, the access aisle and the, and the parking stalls between this building and the current pick and save property are actually part of the Viking Lanes parcel. What page is that? This is page 23. Uh, so the only other place that I can think of then it with the that clarification, and I appreciate that the clarification where the the site boundaries are would be the the uh, three um, parallel parking stalls that are the furthest south in your site. Um, the three that are you run parallel to Main Street there, because with the drive through going around the building. And then with the um, perpendicular stalls that pull up to the front of the building, to me, those three parallel stalls would be the hardest ones to navigate in terms of driving as well as, as parking in and out. Um, I'm assuming that you might have employees be asking employees to park down below near closer to the dumpster. Correct. So that's that's there, probably the only is, place that could probably do it. There's a small patio on the west side directly 
west of the building facing the existing Pizza Hut. Yep. That we were considering using it as some outdoor seating. Uh, if I were to remove that concrete and put some landscaping in there, I don't know if I could get up to the full 25%, but I could attempt to do that. Right now, you could actually have tables out there with the pavement? Yeah, it, it, I believe one of the restaurants originally did. Okay. There were tables and chairs out there. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd want to, I mean, again, I I don't know if I'd want to give that up. Because again, we can grandfather you. I just want to see if there might be some opportunities to green this up a little bit. Because there is so much pavement. Um, yeah. But I like the idea of having at least a few places to eat outside as well. So, well, we we would like that as well. Uh, it's it may be a trade off. Uh, the reason that we're concerned about the parking on the south side is uh, the delivery drivers. There are going to be at least three cars there that are going to be reserved for delivery drivers, and if the percent. 90% of our orders now come in through internet. We've actually taken a bunch of phone lines out because people enter the orders over the internet. So our goal is to have that pizza ready when the customer first comes up to the window. So if for any reason it's not ready, what we would ask them to do would be to pull around to the side, front side of the building, the south side, and we'll have some reserved spots there for uh, people waiting for their pizza to be carried out to them. So between the delivery drivers and the reserved spots for uh, pickup, uh, we were trying to maintain at least as many parking spots as we could. Dining customers, uh, we don't anticipate a lot of dining customers. I, I actually did a projection uh, if we get five tables a night, I think that'll be good. Uh, so that area would also best suit our dining customer, even though it's not that big of a mount. So which, which I, stalls I guess I, I'd have to talk to the operations people as to would they rather give up the outdoor seating or the parking. So you're, when you're talking about, the, you're talking about the three, the three stalls that are on the south of the property is where your delivery vehicles will be located. Correct. Okay. And then people who are dying in or else waiting for their pizza would pull up building in the Correct. other stall. Correct. Okay. There's actually a handicap ramp there that's shown in the black. Uh, that's an existing handicap ramp that we were going to reutilize. Okay. All right, and if once I pull in, just so I understand the site, once I pull into the parking area there that we're talking about, I have to go back out to the west as well, right? Because there's there's either bumpers or landscaping that prevents you from cutting into the drive lane. There's right. actually curbing all around that. There's a cement curb on the south side. That, that drive-through lane has a curb that goes all the way around to the building. Okay, so they come back out the way they came in. Yes, sir. All right. All right, any other questions or comments from the commission? Obviously, we would like to see it grandfathered around the uh, landscaping plan that we submitted uh, for obvious reasons, but if we have to do something, we have to do something. Uh, it, from what it sounds like, we, we can ask, but we can't require. I, I think okay. it's this largely falls within the. So I just want to see if there might be some potential, but we've talked about those challenges. So. Okay. Any other questions or comments from commission? All right, then I would entertain a motion. Move to approve. I'll second. What's the motion? 
The motion would be to approve the site plan as submitted, including the grandfathering in of the um, percentage required for landscape. Right, any other any other questions or comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. So I think I can turn this back over to the mayor. You can keep going if you want. You did great. <laughs> I've, I've blocked my way through. Thank you all. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Item number six is a request by Chad Strutzel for. Uh, He's representing tailgaters for approval of awnings and signage installation at 151 East Main Street. And uh, Rodney or Michael, you wanna walk us through this? So this is part of the downtown design overlay district. Um, therefore it's before you tonight as a, as a result of that review process. Um, the staff review letter is concluded in here as well. And if you have any questions, we'd certainly answer them. I know the applicant's also on online if you've got questions of him. Are there any uh, questions? I, I do have one question. Um, I didn't see in the packet what the material of the awning was. Uh, it's just a regular, you know, canvas type material. So it is canvas. Yeah. Wonderful. As opposed to what? Um, I've seen plastic ones that look real similar to that, which I think if it was more of a plastic material or some other kind of sheeting, that then it wouldn't be as um, as compatible to the building. Um, but but certainly the canvas awning is is what was very traditional to these kinds of buildings. Any other questions or comments? All right, looks pretty sharp to me. Um, I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, last chance, questions, comments? I think it looks real nice. All right, yep. all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Uh, thanks for being here, Chad. All right, thank you. Item number seven is a request by Bob Dvorak for approval of a resolution to proceed with an urban service area amendment application for the 51 West development area. And uh, Rodney, you wanna walk us through this? Certainly. So what, what's in your packet tonight is how we're gonna frame it as being maybe um, a preliminary application of material. We're still doing a staff review and we've, we've asked for a couple of clarifications. Um, but this is the area that we've been working with Bob Dvorak on the Highway 51 West um, development concept. This would add the area in question into the urban service area. I'm going to pull up another illustration. Obviously, there, there's a lot of information in the packet here, um, but it, I just wanted to be able to show you a number of illustrations and maps on that are contained within it. And maybe if I can get to the one I'm seeking out first. So at this point, we're not looking for action tonight though, right? Yeah, I was gonna explain you know, where we're at in the process a little bit more here, just one second. And then while you're looking at that, I, I know Bob's on the, on the call and so is Jason from MSA. If there's any questions for them when Rodney's done, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer them. Yeah. So what I wanted to do is first of all, let, let the group know that we believe this is a, a very good package of material. Um, we think we're nearly complete there. We just had some final final items that we're we're working through and question uh, getting answers to uh, so we can have a good final adoption of this and recommendation to the council in April. Part of the the requirement 
for submitting this to the CARPC group is a resolution by the city council. And before the city council uh, would be in a position to make a recommendation and move the application forward, because ultimately it's the city of Stoughton application to the Capillary Regional Planning Commission to amend the urban service area. Uh, we're hoping to have in place an agreement that outlines some of the utility improvements that would be necessary to facilitate um, urban services for this area. For example, looping in of a water main to the area to Kettle Park West. There's a sanitary sewer uh, that needs to be upsized in Kingsland. Obviously, there's extension of water and sanitary sewer across Highway 51. So as part of that, we're, we're working through uh, trying to get an agreement that will uh, be timed out at the same time as council action for the urban service area application to outline that the landowner would be responsible for these improvements. Um, as you, as the council members know, there, there may be a TIF um, uh, a contribution to this project uh, that wouldn't preclude the possibility of TIF, but it would outline uh, that ultimately uh, the development will need those type of improvements to be fully serviced properly. And so I think that's that's in a nutshell of what the overall urban service area amendment is for. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not putting on right, the right map, Jason, to show the actual limits. Um, so, but I wanted to also highlight this does include the properties within the Eggleston's Woods to be added to the urban service area. That does not um, uh, require connection or even annexation, because at this point, uh, properties that would be served with sewer and water would need to be annexed to the city. Um, but certainly right now, uh, there's not any any discussions ongoing about doing so. And, and therefore, um, to make the boundaries, we believe, appropriately squared off, this area does include the Eggleston's Woods area into the Urban Service Area Amendment application. You'll, you'll note in the packet of material, there are letters that we'll be sending off to the township um, to gauge any support or interest in, in this, even as, a, as it goes through the Capillary Regional Planning Commission hearing process, they'll be notified directly of that as well from them. But nonetheless, uh, we'll send out a letter to that effect uh, to let them know that if they have any particular questions, they can contact us and or share their comments directly to the Capillary Regional Planning Commission at the same time. So uh, the long and the short of it is we've got a very detailed a technical document here, um, but we believe that it meets the requirements for the Capillary Regional Plan Commission application in submittal, albeit we still need to get a resolution from the council in order to forward it to Capillary Regional Planning Commission. Um, in light of us just working out what we think is just one small uh, item yet uh, related to a question we've posed, um, we'd anticipate this being before the Planning Commission at action at their meeting in April uh, to be also followed by the Council for their action and support to move it forward to the Capillary Regional Planning Commission at that point. Um, Jason or Bob or others uh, on the, the design team, um, did I do that justice or is there something you thought worthy of adding to the, to the discussion? Uh, this is Jason. I'll jump in to say I, I think that's adequate introduction of it. There's not a whole lot I did wish to add to it, uh, but definitely available to respond to questions that people have. All right. At this point, I would open it up for any questions that the commissioners might have. I'll say that I very much enjoyed reading through the report. Um, I know that you probably don't get that heard too often, um, but I liked especially the the specific hydrological data, especially the historic and the climatological data that was in there. In fact, I was wondering, could I get some of the the uh, climatological data and and the rainfall data as an Excel file? I think we can work with MSA to get that for you. That'd be great. I mean, that's just uh, in, in general, general Stoughton curiosity for me uh, as a number of times I've been wanting to look back over years and just can't seem to find the source of, of data, at least not tabulated as well as that one was over history. 
Um, I also like the uh, the wetlands analysis, especially of the soil types and uh, and the plant species that were located in the areas in there. Well, Jason and I didn't get a chance to discuss this today, maybe putting you on the spot a little bit, Jason, but can you give me an update on where we're at or how close we are to finalizing that small item we were talking about late last week? Uh, are we, which item is that, the stormwater modeling? Yes, yep. So that's, that's in progress this week. Um, for the benefit of the group here, we had uh, been talking with staff about uh what standard we're designing to and the the request had been that we that we design to uh, both rate and volume control for the 200 year storm and uh <clears throat> which is consistent with anticipated dane county regulations that are going to be likely approved uh sometime uh this this spring or mid-year and so uh, we've we've agreed to that, and that's reflected in this document. And the the further request uh, last week from staff was to uh, also provide the modeling showing that it works, and and that's in progress. What uh, what we've got now and the sizing of things is based on uh, is is based on uh, projections with some uh, some error uh, built in, meaning some some cushion. And uh, we need to actually uh, finalize a grading plan and have specific volumes for each pond and uh, build all that into a hydrologic model that shows how the water moves from uh, from pond to pond and through the system. So uh, that's uh, the grading plan is uh, was completed uh, late last week, and the modeling is. Uh, should be happening. Uh, the preliminary modeling should be happening this week. So uh, we definitely expect to have that uh, for the next meeting, but we don't have it tonight. And we have agreed, one way or another, we've, we're agreeing that uh, we're, we're going to meet that standard. So there's a couple of options for commissioners. Obviously, understanding that that's yet to come and, and we wouldn't be able to move it beyond council if that was, you know, standard couldn't be agreed to in part of our application, um, the commissioners could actually move it to council uh, based on the uh, submittal and understanding that there's a staff reconciliation that's going through on this, this item or additional material that would be forwarded to council. Or um, I think the calendar still allows to have one more look at it by the planning commission in April um, with council looking at it soon there or the, the immediately next meeting of council to hopefully move it forward to Carpsey after that. So you have two options. We're comfortable with either. Um, we recognize there's a lot of material here um, and the commissioners also recognize the issues we've had with stormwater in the area. So there's a there's a heightened awareness of that, but they're doing a certain, certainly doing what we've asked them to do uh, to try to address and mitigate concerns related to that topic in this region. And Rodney, that was kind of my question is when they, when they say they're looking at this new standard for the 200 year flood, is the work that they're gonna do also going to help the other connecting areas to this development on that same issue? More than anything, what it does is this protects the, those downstream areas and, and further uh, illustrates that this will not cause detrimental impacts to the downstream area. In essence, they're they're modeling it for um, pretty stringent requirements on site. Yeah, I would add that in most in most storms. Uh, so when we're when we're controlling to that level, in most storms, in most conditions, in most years, uh, I would expect uh, little or no runoff from the site, and uh, less runoff in total from the site than pre-development conditions. So it's the big storms that we're that we're worried about and designing for that uh, kind of compensating for that results in that smaller stuff won't even leave the site. And then as far as commissioners, um, 
any thoughts about whether or not you want to proceed or you want to have another look at it or any additional information you would need? I'd like to hold on it for now to see the more stringent requirement in there. I mean, we, we did not too long ago have a 500 year event. So I, I would certainly like to see how it holds up versus the more stringent uh, um, standards. Just for clarification, this does indicate meeting that standard. What they're working through now is demonstrating how that's possible. Yep. Okay, just so you understood, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and we can certainly, you know, send that out when we receive it, or we can include it in the next packet, whatever your preference is. I don't know that you'll see much different information than what you have now, other than we'll probably have some narrative that outlines um, our level of comfort related to that, that aspect of it. I mean, I certainly wouldn't hold it up because uh, if, if the other commissioners are are prepared to move forward with it, I mean, I know that the that the results probably will not change by change significantly, uh, even with different data into it. Um, if other commissioners are are willing to move ahead, then then I, I won't delay anything. No, I think I I agree with you that we we should uh, wait and see. Okay. Okay. That's fine. I Any other questions or information you're looking for tonight or before the next meeting? Nope, just the full data set so that we've got everything all together. All right, and I would expect, Brett, that between now and the next meeting, you'll be able to recite the whole document. <laughs> I was even looking up some of the invasive species plant names and that. So, yes, I was uh, I was absolutely nerding out on the report. <laughs> All right. Anything else, uh, Jason or or Bob, that you guys want to add tonight? Nothing from me. I know Bob's connection's a little bit spotty right now, but I don't think at this point. I think we're good. Thank you. All right. So um, otherwise, uh, we'll have this back. I think we're good at going. Thank you. OK, we'll move on to the next item then. And that's uh, item number eight. And we have proposed amendments to the zoning code to update Appendix B of the landscaping chart. And as I recall, this was a, a city council goal that was submitted by Alder Person Majewski. Is that true? Could be. Yeah, and then I believe it went to the tree commission and uh, they reviewed it and there's charts and things that were updated in the packet. Who wants to walk through this? Well, actually we have, we have a tree commission member here that Mitch is able to help give us a little more technical background on, on the work that the tree commission did working with the forester, John Campelman, who wasn't able to attend tonight, he planned to, but something came up and he's not able to attend tonight. So I think Mitch is on the line and maybe can help offer some insight. Yeah, Mitch, if you wanna give us a little bit of background before you get into it, and, and thanks for serving on the Tree Commission. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, the, the original ask was, uh, as you see here on the screen, was, was from um, Majewski back in 17 to review the, the point system and specifically looking at the point system um, and how that compares to other communities and how he and that he feels that the city is lacking in diversity. A clarification came down from um, Director Hebert that uh, we were to look at just Appendix B, which was the list of species associated with the landscape ordinance. So we did that. Um, so our key decision points here, there's four of them. The first was that we weren't gonna to touch the landscape point system um, because that was um, wrapped into the complete article and was beyond the scope or cap capability or capacity of the tree commission to deal with that. That's gonna require um, 
the zoning administrator and the city plan commission to to deal with the actual point system because then it sprink, sprinkled along that entire article six. Um, so we attacked appendix B, which was the long list of species. Um, we modified it based on the needs of the, the urban forest. Um, the recommendations from many uh, forestry departments around the nation is 5% uh, presence of by genus within the tree, uh, urban tree um, canopy. So many of the, the species were removed from that list. For example, Acer species, the, the maples, 35% of the urban forest is currently maples. So we didn't want to promote the use of maples um, within the city um, for a variety of reasons because of disease and, and insects. Um, as you're all well aware of the, the emerald ash borer taking out our ash canopy. Um, we removed invasive species. Things have changed since the list was initiated early on. Um, some of those species are now controlled by the Department of Natural Resources. Removed poor performing and, and disease prone species. And then we really simplified the list to remove all the um, cultivars and all the growth rate information. This was done, one, to improve the, the legibility of an extremely long list, recognizing we can't have a comprehensive list and also recognizing the, the knowledge base of the, the landscaping um, folks that are involved in this. They're gonna understand which cultivars are gonna work. Um, they know the growth rates, the size. Um, we don't wanna get into that nitty, nitty gritty detail. Um, there was also some redundancy in the ordinance. There was a table and an appendix. We consolidated that into one appendix um, and then modified the language within the text uh, to instead of talking or referring to the zoning administrator that they if there was any modifications or any lists or any species that weren't on that list that they wanted um, for consideration that they would talk to the city forester and or the city tree commission for approval of any species that were not on the list. That's the gist of it. And I believe you have uh, Appendix B which is the new simplified list and the modification to the ordinance text itself. We kept the, the, the groups the same and the point system the same. All right, uh, thank you, Mitch. Uh, anything, uh, Rodney or Michael, that you wanna add? Nothing, nothing but appreciation for the Tree Commission's efforts in doing so. Their review and experience, I think, was demonstrated in the fact that um, they really are the experts in, in the representatives for the trees in, in our urban canopy. So we appreciated their input, as well as now that having the forester playing a role in, in this review process as well has been helpful. Thank all you. right. And then I would probably give all our person, uh, Maeski, the first uh, chance at it. Do you have any initial thoughts or comments? I do. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you. It was a pretty, pretty good sized task, which you took care of. Uh, did get rid of a lot of invasive species that were on the list. I appreciate that. Um, the only question that I have is your classification of difference between climax versus tall deciduous. And also, um, I questioned some of the landscaping points uh, on some of the trees. That's a that's a finite uh, fine points, but overall, thank you for the, the hard work. Yes. Do you want me to address those? Sure. All right. Uh, good eye. Um, you uh, apparently went through it with a fine tooth comb. Um, again, the landscaping points. We originally wanted to modify and completely redo the groups and the landscaping points. But as I had stated, it's it was beyond the scope of the ask. Um, those landscaping points are going to require a, a complete rewrite of Article 6, um, which is beyond what we could do. Uh, the reason that we were promoting and denoting or demoting species from climax to tall deciduous, um, what is the difference between climax and tall deciduous? We went back and forth um, considerably about, and if it was up to us, we would not have those two categories. 
The reason that we moved trees from one category to the other category is because of their presence um, by genus within the forest of Stoughton. So those that were um, great, excellent performers, but were underrepresented in the forest were uh, promoted to climax. And those that were still great performers, but we had high percentages within the urban forest were demoted to tall deciduous trees. It's the way that we could, we could incentivize um, diversity within the city landscape. All right, um, any other questions or comments? Naturally, I absolutely love this report as well because it's all full of plant names and things. Um, no, I, I do like that uh, how you've uh, promoted and demoted some of the trees in there, um, along with Alder Myeski. Uh, you know, I might pick and choose a few different in there, but um, so be it as it is. Yeah, we wanted oaks as climax, but we're running at eight percent of uh, the urban forest at oaks. It's number three um, within the city. Yeah, I. Can I say something? Um, we totally agree with you, uh, except some of them that you have in the, the climax, bad performers. Your 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 platinus uh, genus is is not is is not a good. You know, we, you're 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 promoting it, and that's great. Unfortunately, the mortality rate on those is in the first five years is huge. So, you know, it's great to have that idea of uh, percentages. However, some of the, like I said, you know, some of those genuses do, do not perform well here. And we're basically putting out for statistical reasons here, but you're also then basically taking, putting lambs to slaughter. Yeah, specifically the American sycamore. Yes, sir. Uh, yep. Then that's why the the preferred species would be the London plane tree, which is a which is a solid performer in the region. So but, you know, but, so I'm, I'm questioning. You know, the problem is is that you have a a 75 point landscape on it, so developers are going are going to choose less trees, higher points. They're going to stick one of those in there, and in five years is that 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 sycamore is going to be dead. And then there you are. You know, that, that's the kind of stuff that, that that needs to be looked at, you know, in that, in that portion. So to, to follow up on that, is that kind of data monitored in our tree inventory? Yes. Yep. So okay. the sycamore specifically, um, was a last minute addition um, because there are some good performers, um, but we can uh, we can revisit that. I, I, I would like to see that because, you know, you took out all the cultivars and everything else and you, you, you've gone to basic broad categories. Mm -hmm. You're not going to you're not going to get the the true performers. You're going to get whatever is available out there. I think <clears throat> I, I think if I'm understanding correctly, we have two things going on here in the sense that as part of a landscape plan, if we have an existing tree, um, the developer would get the 75 points for keeping it versus they would also get 75 points for planting a new plant, a new tree that would eventually potentially grow. And so I think when they, it sounded like from when I first understood the, the tree commission when they went through this was they wanted to be able to give solid points and good credit for um, existing trees to be retained and be part of these development plans. Um, but then you, what you're bringing up is the issue of also um, plans that include adding additional trees. And you get the same points, I think, either way. My, no, my, you're missing the point. The point is, is that 
if they're going to, they're going to be planting a, a species of tree that is has known failure rate, it should be it should not have a high point value so that is being used. No, I, I I did understand that, but I think what we're saying that is if there's an existing sycamore on a site that's already past that critical stage and is is performing well because it's mature, then the developer would get 75 points for keeping it. And I think the reason that they originally kept it in the climax tree category of the list was to be because it, once it gets past that critical stage, it's part of the urban forest. You know what I'm saying? I think we got two issues going on with giving points for existing vegetation versus giving points for vegetation that will be planted. The other I question I that. had, the other question I had is, did the tree commission give consideration or was there a recommendation to have us update the point system? No, we did not recommend that, I, but that's definitely a possibility. I, I, for one, believe that our point system is needs an update. And I have thought that for years. We, so we have a draft. Good. We have a draft. We started down that road, but when you start looking at Article Six, it, it's well beyond the scope of of the Tree Commission. So certainly appreciate that. So I guess maybe at a future meeting, we can talk about what the process of evaluating our point system looks like. Uh, we're not gonna resolve that issue tonight, but if that's something that we should at least consider, maybe that's a future agenda item. I would hope so. And again, I wanna, I wanna thank the Tree Commission. They did a great job. Yes, thank you. And if there is, a, if you guys feel we should take American sycamore off or any other species, um, we can make those modifications. I think, what or at least it would to to have, uh, like, if you could under the botanical name there, um, just kind of put an asterisk or a footnote or something in there to indicate things like like Tom suggesting, like if, if it's a one to five year old tree that it's gonna have uh, significant problems or potential problems uh, versus existing ones, at least have within the appendix, uh, maybe just add in a footnote for, you know, maybe there's there's only a handful of species that are in here that are a little bit more temperamental. All right, that sounds good. Um, we do have a need for a public hearing on this one. I don't think anyone was signed up to speak, but I would close the regular meeting and reopen for the public hearing. If there's anybody out there that would wish to speak, um, please go ahead. Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing and reopen. Um, we're looking for a recommendation to the council. Does somebody like to make that? I move that goes to council. Is there a I'll second? second. I'll and second. second. All right. Any more discussion? I just just one thing. Uh, if from from Todd, this is uh, I, I think it might help, and maybe I'm just missing some of the context. Um, but I, I think either in that first paragraph under section seventy eight six eleven at the start there, um, being a little bit more clear that. Um, these are um, varieties that are being recommended for use within Stoughton and hence the point system and then hence the ones that are considered to be non-contributing. It gets a little bit confusing in the, the title of the table and the way this is set up um, that, you know, exactly what the list is, I, I think, unless I'm just missing some of the context. I, mean, I understand it based on our conversations and having used the the ordinance, but just looking through and just reading what we've been provided, I could see where um, it might be a little unclear in terms of why some varieties are included in the Yeah, 
our attempt was to reduce modifications to text as much as possible, um, recognizing that modifications to that those ordinances may uh, involve the attorney at some level, trying to modify that much with our unfamiliarity with modifying ordinances. Um, so we we only modified a, a couple words um, in the entire entire thing, except for the list itself. And is, is that something we can do when we do the point system? I think it's possible. The other, I mean, it might be just to, to modify, if we look at the title for Appendix B, where it says landscape charts and checklists, de detailed classification of plant species, it might be good to include in that table, that, st that statement that's in the paragraph about species suitable for landscaping use and compatible with Dane County climate and soil factors. You know, something along those lines so that it's clear that these are a select group of species that are being encouraged because of compatibility and um, suitability within Stoughton. Something along those lines. I think just changing the title of the table might help. All right, did you catch that Rodney or Michael? And is everybody good with it? I did not know where that language came from. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not seeing where you're talking about for that language. Right, on, if you look right in the middle of this page here that's on the screen. Yep. That middle sentence where it says species suitable for landscaping use and compatible with Dane County climate and soil factors are listed in Appendix B. So yep. that's that, that gives some context for what's included in that table and not. I think if that is somehow reflected in the title of the table, it'll help. This language. Either that language or something like it, I, unless I'm the only person that, that feels that there might be a little bit of a disconnect. I think it makes the table more clear, that's for sure, or the intent of the table. All right, so Rodney can probably massage the language on that and, and, and insert that. Any other questions or comments? All right, hearing none, all in favor of the recommendation to council say aye. 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 And any opposed? That motion carries. Uh, thanks again, Mitch, and, and to the team of, on the tree commission. Next item is a proposed amendment to the zoning code to allow mobile food vending on private property and clarify general outdoor sales regulations. And um, we have uh, attorney Schneider and attorney Dragney, I think are both on here and who would like to lead off tonight? I think that's on me. So we're coming before you today with two versions of the ordinance. And if you recall where we were last time is we were gonna step back and take a look at it one more time and just make sure we were comfortable with where things are. And so stepping back, if we look at zoning in general, um, land uses that are not called out in the zoning code are generally not allowed. And so mobile vending is something that's not expressly permitted in the zoning code. And historically, it's our understanding that the city has been authorizing mobile vending as a temporary use under general temporary outdoor sales. Uh, there's also some potential for mobile vending to be um, something that's acceptable under a couple of other categories. And we can talk about those uh, if that would be helpful. But what this ordinance is intended to do is to expressly authorize mobile vending, um, which is defined to mean retail sales to the general public. So this isn't expressly about private use of, of food carts, um, but this expressly authorizes it. And then as a land use, it's still categorized as temporary. And we can talk about why that is, um, but it then also allows the city to impose requirements specifically on mobile vending that wouldn't necessarily apply to other forms of outdoor sales. So what 
why you have two versions of the ordinance is really about how the temporary use is approved. Um, we have attempted to create identical regulations for mobile vending. So if you see any differences, let us know. But the only differences you should see are how temporary uses are approved. Um, specifically, if you remember, I believe it was the perhaps the last plan commission meeting or maybe the one before that, Attorney Dragney presented about Act 67, which is something you're all, I'm sure, very familiar with. You've heard about many times. You think about it typically in terms of conditional use permits, but if you look at the language of the statute, it actually applies to conditional use permits, special exceptions, and other special zoning permissions. So it's actually broader than just applying to conditional use permits. And so we've presented two versions of this with that in mind. One would create a process whereby temporary uses all temporary uses, including mobile vending, but all of the other ones that are um, applicable to the city would be approved through the planning commission. We have also presented an alternative version that would be um, an administrative approval only, meaning would only need to go through the zoning administrator and each would not have to be reviewed by the plan commission. To do that, we have attempted to remove as much discretion as possible. So it's more of a ministerial decision, more like a issuing a building permit or something like that. But that was an attempt to remove it from what would be considered a special zoning exception. Um, that's not a guarantee that it would survive all challenge, but it's something that we thought was um, administratively perhaps more feasible for the city, but we're presenting these to you as an option and hoping to get your feedback on which model you prefer. Um, we've also made a few adjustments to the regulations. If you look through and compare to what you had before you last time, there's a few differences. Um, one of those is that the temporary use in the prior version was something that could be obtained um, once per calendar year, that limitation has been removed. So what, what is created by these ordinances is a structure under which someone can get approval for 180 days. And before that 180 days expires, they could submit another application and get approval for an additional 180 days. And that can just keep going. So in effect, you ultimately have what could be considered something of a permanent use but it does expire every 180 days and that gives the city the flexibility to potentially change um, regulations in between. Um, we're trying to avoid creating vested rights in the way that we would with um, permitted, um, permitted land use categories. Um, and we've also made a couple of adjustments that um, you would see in the version that we would hope to take to public hearing. This was done after the packet was submitted to you all. And I can just tell you there's three different changes that um, based on staff recommendation, we would include in a version that goes to public hearing at the next plan commission meeting. One of those is that under the current version that you have before you, there's a requirement that temporary signage com uh, comply with existing regulations relating to temporary signs we would at staff recommendation add language to that that expressly provides that someone who gets temporary use approval for mobile vending or general temporary outdoor sales still has to comply with temporary signage regulations but doesn't have to get a separate permit and wouldn't have to pay a separate fee for putting up that temporary sign um, we have also modified the window of time during which a mobile vending unit can operate. Right now, the version you have before you says it's from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. We would change that to 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. And then we would add a limitation on use of drive throughs essentially providing that anybody that sets up a mobile vending unit is not permitted to also establish a drive through for that unit. So that's a pretty high level overview. Happy to answer questions and concerns. 
All right, who wants to be first? I'm just going to say that uh, I was happy to see that they could renew it after 180 days or before the 180 days were up. So I'm happy to see that inclusion in this packet. So I think it's important to highlight this. This would need to go to public hearing again. We, we talked about <clears throat> these two options being presented to you. Obviously, the, the staff review version um, is a more uh, defined structure and would not burden applicants to get before the plan commission. We think there might be um, quite a number that would have to go through the plan commission process if if that's the route we go. Um, and, and I think that's why uh, we worked with the attorney's office to try to structure it with a pretty prescribed process that might allow the staff um, review a process to be done administratively without having to go through the planning commission for every every application. So in practice, Rodney, if, if somebody wanted to operate a mobile food cart, what would really the process be? Well, under the staff version, th there's a submittal requirement that's outlined in the ordinance that says they have to put together an application to meet these uh, site plan requirements as well as submittal requirements that then is reviewed at the staff level for compliance with the regulations and if it complies with the regulations the fee has been obtained and the submittal is complete and compliant a permit would be issued um, in the other version you'd still have the submittal requirements the application fee the staff review and then you'd have to go through a public hearing and you'd have to set a public hearing for a plan commission review and ultimately, I, I believe uh, confirmation by council. So you'd have the plan commission hearing with a recommendation to council and then a council action at a subsequent meeting. Rachel, this is Matt. I'm not sure we actually put it we required council approval, didn't we? Set it up so plan commission would make the final Sorry. decision. Right, you did set it up so plan commission would be the final approval on, in that regard. Yes. Yep. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. And anything else you want to add, Matt, at this point, or should we open it up for questions? Nothing for me. You know, and from my perspective, we started this at the CACP committee um, in June of 2019. So it's been the better part of two years to get to this point. And it started out as a standalone ordinance. And after working with Matt and then Rachel, I think we just decided that, you know, going through the zoning was probably the best way of doing it. So here, here we are, um, this is what we have. And, and, you know, I'd like to see if there's any other feedback or suggestions or anything that you thought we missed along the way. I thought of one minor yeah, clarification this is Todd. That, that I was looking for. Okay, go um, ahead, Brett. In the in the 180 day um, term of the temporary use permit, um, it states in there that it has to be 180 or can't be greater than 180 consecutive days. Would that mean that they would have to at least have a 24 hour period in between those 180 day uh, permit operation times? Is that how that would be worded? It seems like they couldn't be concurrent. No, it wouldn't have to be set up that way. So the so somebody could essentially apply for their next permit and have it start immediately after that that 180 day expiration. So it could run if if they get their application in on time and review is done, there wouldn't have to be that gap. So it's really just you have 180 days of approval to use the land in that particular way. And if you then get another okay. approval, it would they could butt right up against each other. All right, I guess I'm looking at the, the 100, no more than 180 consecutive days. So then if you do run them concurrently, then that would create, well, not for that particular permit, maybe that's the part that's, that's confusing in there. It's not confusing. So it's the, the one permit can run for 180 days and then if you get a completely new permit 
it's a, a new 180 days. Right. Okay, so I'm I'm thinking back to um, how we had it worded before, where you couldn't have it more than 180 in a calendar year. So right. Yep, um, and that's modified. Okay. Yeah, and I think that you know if if it was done administratively by the zoning uh, department, it's less likely that it would lapse. Uh, or if we had to take it to plan commission and, and have a public hearing, then we we may have a potential issue there if the application gets turned in late. Got it. Uh, Commissioner Barman, did you have something? Yeah, I do, just a couple things. One is um, I, I'd like to say that I, I think I prefer the option that is uh, the staff review option. I think it makes more sense within the context of the way this has been worded. Um, I don't think this is something that should necessarily have to be a, a public hearing and plan commission review kind of item every time. Um, but along those lines, to me, I think, I, and I also agree that I like the idea that you could potentially have um, consecutive, or I shouldn't say consecutive, but back to back uh applications so you could have a, a, a essentially your your temporary use continue beyond the 180 days with a new permit um, but i guess from a, a staff perspective um, what happens if in that 180 days which i think is part of the reason for having 180 days it, what happens if there are conflicts that arise for example if um, that particular mobile food vendor um, there starts to create traffic concerns, or if there's um, a conflict with adjacent property owners, or those kinds of things. Is is there enough in your site plan review authority to be able to say this just isn't working out? Um, so we're not going to renew your your uh, or reissue another temporary permit for another 180 days. Well, this is Matt. I think the answer is no. Because if they met the if they met the requirements to get the permit once, then they would meet the requirements every single time, unless the requirements are changed. Right. So Matt, I would just qualify that slightly, and just say that one of the requirements is that they not impair traffic or pedestrian flow. So to the extent that something would change in how they're operating or something that would result in a changed traffic issue, there's some potential there. Okay, well, that's a fair, that's a fair, yeah, that's under G, <clears throat> and I see that. So, so overall, I agree, Matt, with Matt's assessment. Yeah, and, and, and this is the challenge we face. So when, when the permit is issued the first time, the standard requires the zoning administrator to just make a judgment. Will this use impair traffic or pedestrian flow? or, or <clears throat> And if the first time he issues the permit, he says, no, it won't permit is issued but the thing is how is he going to know that there is there's no evidentiary there's no evidentiary process that would allow the zoning and the, the only thing the zoning administrator gets to see and base a decision on is the permit application period there is nothing else and so the fact that he hears somebody complains oh there's a traffic problem it's outside the record so this is the challenge we face with the administrative approval. You'd face a similar situation in that if the if it did go through plan commission review process, you would have taken the testimony at the time of issuance of the permit. And if the complaint came in after that, you'd have the same situation. Yes, but next time the person applied for a permit, Rachel, can we look at the stand or whoever's controlling this Green, can we go to the standards for approval if it's the plan commission process? I believe there is a standard that would create, first of all, there would be a public hearing second time. Right. And nine. Yeah. Yeah. So the second, so so if we had a temporary approval issued for a 180-day period, and then there was an application for a new 180-day period. And in the meantime, there had been problems, and now there's a public hearing. Then, the plan commission could take testimony regarding uh, the 
application. And I guess the question is now the, the plan commission could be presented with evidence that there's a traffic problem. So the question is if it's an administrative approval and the only thing you have to look at is the application, same application you got the first time, you know, how do you, how do you deny it on the grounds that it's going to create a traffic problem? So that's the, that's the conundrum we're in with this administrative approval. You're saying the zoning administrator would not be able to take those same emails or phone calls into consideration as the plan commission. It's not part of the process. It, the, the decision needs to be based on the application under the administrative approval process. I think so what would happen. I think what would happen then is if we became aware of a situation, we would probably be uh, presenting a potential code amendment change prior to the next <laughs> issuance of a permit, just like was suggested. If something's not working in an administrative review process, there's potential to change the, the permit standards going forward after that application period. So I think we'd then present the case to have the ordinance amended to possibly address that particular scenario in, in general terms for all, all sites. I think that's correct. That yeah. if you're in the middle of a, of a period of approval, if somebody is creating problems, there's technically an issue, they're in, in violation of the zoning code. I'm, I'm trying to, this is Todd again, I'm trying to think if for other applications to, and again, this might be because it's to come in before the plan commission and not before staff, but as part of an application, can you have them submit, um, rather than just uh, submitting a site plan, submit any available evidence to the uh, fact that um, there won't be, can we, can we ask them to show that there won't be traffic conflicts or pedestrian conflicts? And the first time, because they weren't there, there's not much they could submit. But the second time they can say, um, well, we're submitting the fact that there haven't been any accidents or haven't been any complaints. Todd, yeah. I think I know what you're trying to accomplish. I just don't really know that it's a practical matter. It's possible to accomplish that by just modifying the application requirements. I mean, maybe, okay. but it strikes me as very difficult. I, I would think it would be too. So what this is telling me is that, you know, I'm, I'm listening to this. Yeah, is this really a misnomer We're calling this temporary? Because basically this is a, a, a temporary, perm, basically a temporary permanent uh, use because you just keep on renewing every 80, every 180 days. And if, as long as the traffic is good, you can just keep on going no matter what. I mean, you know, somewhere in there, there's gotta be a break. I'm sorry, we, temporary is, definition of temporary is, is, is not the same as permanent, static, continuous use. Yes, your concern is heard and we've grappled with that a lot as we've talked about this issue and we've gone back and forth. I think we have landed on temporary use as something that's still our recommendation because granting someone a permitted or permanent use brings with it rights that the city may not wish to bestow upon someone who's setting up a food cart. And there's just sort of a natural, um, there's just some conflict here between the idea of land use as something that goes for a long time and runs, you know, the particular use runs with the land and the approval runs with the land versus the, an economic activity that in most cases is transient. And so I think this 180 day temporary requirement, although could effectively be permanent for someone who chooses to renew it again and again and again, still gives the city the flexibility to say, well, we are changing our requirements and we can do that and you have no right to come sue us and say that you have a vested right because your approval expires after this 180 days. 
And so we're hoping to, to retain that flexibility for the city by, by using this use, uh, this temporary use category. I, yeah, and I, I think I think my concern would be is at least the initial application, if 180 days is the appropriate time. You know, I think once they're established and things are going well, I feel a lot more comfortable with 180 days. It's that initial, you know, few months or so where there's uncertainty on, on how things are going to go. And we really didn't talk about that. And I don't even know if that's a viable option. Yeah, let, this is Matt. Let me just, it, the concern is, let's say you have a, a shorter period of time, whatever it is, pick, it doesn't really matter what the time period is. If the concern is, well, we need to, we need to let it happen and then see how it goes. Well, what if you don't like how it goes? Then where are you? The way this is set up, um, the only thing that you really have as an option is to go in and amend the ordinance and change and either say this is no longer going to be allowed as a temporary use, either here or anywhere, or or we're going to change the rules in some way. So, um, and, and I'm suggesting we'd rather do that sooner than later. <laughs> Well, you could require a a shorter. You could make the you could shorten up the time from 180 days to something less than that. Can you add that the initial 180 days for um, an applicant be uh, essentially a probationary 180 days, and then you can roll into um, more acceptance after you, you give them a, a try at least. I don't think you can do that. Remember, this is a zoning ordinance. Yep. Okay. You're not you, you're you're making a decision about whether this kind of activity is appropriate on a given parcel of land in a given zoning district. And so the concept of, you know, well, we'll, we'll test it out on a probationary basis is really foreign to the to the world of zoning. The, the only that we're getting we're, we're at, we are doing that it's temporary that so every 180 day period or whatever it is is in a sense another probationary period because what we're saying is if this doesn't go well we can go in and rewrite the zoning code and when your approval expires you don't have a vested right to just keep doing it which you would have if we characterize this as simply a permitted use or even a conditional use. Any other so, thoughts or questions? I mean, you know, obviously the hope is, is that, you know, we grant the permit and we don't have any issues. Um, and I think this discussion I, I, is just trying to make sure we're protected. I, I thought of two things, Mayor. Um, and, and, and our and our legal counsel. One thing is that um, my guess is on something like that that item G, where it says mobile food venues shall not impair traffic or pedestrian flow, nor shall it obstruct vision or 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 intersecting streets or driveways. Now, staff, if we go to the staff approval route, they're going to have to look at the site plan and make a judgment on that. Um, and you're saying that they, no other additional evidence can be submitted, but if if after the fact we can say, well, we did the site plan drawing just really didn't do a good job at showing it. Um, I'm not sure if staff has any ability to reevaluate a site plan that's being submitted based on their increased knowledge. So I asked that question, but also I'm guessing part of this may self-regulate too, in that these mobile food vendors will not be on public property. They will be on private property. Um, they'll have to have an arrangement with the other with the uh, property owner who there is making space available to them, like the pick and save parking lot. Yeah. And my guess is that there was conflict with pedestrians and traffic flow and other kinds of things. My guess is someone like pick and save would say, you know, this just isn't working. Um, you can't be here anymore. 
Um, and, and I think that's part of this process as well, correct? I would just qualify that slightly and say that these are not allowed in the right of way, so they're not allowed on the streets, um, but they could be allowed on other public property that isn't deemed right of way with permission from the city. But the but the Commissioner Barman's point is well taken that the property owner has the right to say this isn't working out, whether that be the city or pick and save or anyone else. And that's not a zoning issue. That's a property owner having the ability to control the property owner's property. Now, if you as a property owner enter into a, a long-term lease with someone and say, you know, you can lease this for two years or three years, well, you're stuck with it then uh, for the term of the lease. Um, but yes, that's another potential check on that kind of problem. To your other point, Commissioner Barman, you asked about the site plan. So the site plan requirements are specified in the ordinance. So theoretically, the first site plan that is submitted should meet the requirements of the ordinance. I'm not sure how much flexibility the zoning administrator would have to say, well, I approved the first site plan, um, but now in hindsight, I can see I probably shouldn't have, and so I'm gonna make you submit a different kind of site plan. I mean, they're gonna be, they have to submit a site plan that meets the requirements of the ordinance, whatever that is. So the, the, the permit, when it's reapplied for, does not have to include a new site plan. Could we, no. could we make it? No, every it would. They'd have to submit a new site plan. But it, it again, they could submit the same site plan they did the first time. If that one met the requirements of the ordinance the first time, it would be hard for the zoning administrator to reject that. He already, he already the accepted ordinance. it once and said it, 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 it met their requirements. So he'd have unless, to have something he could point to and say it doesn't meet it. Yeah, unless we change the ordinance in between. Correct. I think what I heard from Rachel. Yeah, yep. that's right. Or, or, or unless the site plan wasn't as accurate as it could be or should be. Because so I, I think that could be part of it. Sometimes it just could be inaccuracies in, in the site plan submitted. Um, it could happen, yes. Well, my last question, in, just so I understand it, is re in relation to the signage that would go along with these temporary uses. So I think what you had said earlier was that the proposal would be that signage would be approved essentially as part of this one application. They essentially submit their their site plan and everything else to be approved as a as a temporary use, which would include whatever signage that they had planned as part of their overall proposal. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Plus so there this, wouldn't be a, the signage would still have to, the signage would still have to meet the sign requirements for the district, um, but, but they would not, would not be encumbered with an extra permit for the signage. Or permit fee. Okay. And and so would it make sense to up the permit fee on the temporary use because now it's folding in that what have would have been a fee for the signage approval as well? We we haven't vetted out the permit fee pricing, but yeah, yeah, that could be a consideration. All right, any questions or comments from any of the other commissioners that haven't spoke on this item yet? I won't name names. So mayor, the question is, which of these uh, approaches does the plan commission want to go to public hearing on, right? They need to make a, a decision on which one to, to hold a hearing on. That's correct. I want to go no. with the one that is, it just goes through zoning. I think we've got so many what ifs and we'd never work through this uh, with all these different scenarios that each of us can dream up. And I think they, that uh, the two attorneys done a good job of tying this down. And I say we go with the one that just goes through zoning and not through the planning commission and having a, uh, a special meeting on it every time. Well, just All right, anybody that. else? I, was I agree with uh, going through the zoning I approval. 
All right. Anybody not agree with that? All right. So it sounds like we're we're going to recommend that it goes through the zoning, which I agree with that. I think we probably have, for the most part, hopefully more longevity in the zoning department than you know, the planning commission turns over more often. And I think we probably get more consistency, at least I'm hoping so, out of the zoning department. Um, so that's my two cents worth on that one. Um, anything else on this topic? So Rodney, next steps. We'll set it for a public hearing, uh, likely in the April meeting and distribute it uh, accordingly and anticipate moving it to consideration at the next meeting. If, if you guys wake up in the middle of the night tonight in a cold sweat because you forgot to bring something up, let us know tomorrow morning and or whenever, sometime between now and the next uh, public hearing and we can uh, have Matt or Rachel give us their opinion on it before the meeting. All right, so I think that's it for that topic. Um, we have future agenda items. Um, obviously, this will be on there. We talked about possibly at some point um, seeing what might be involved with the point system for the landscaping plan. Um, not sure if we'll be able to do that internally or if that's going to be uh, maybe a budgetary item if we need help with it. I'm not really sure what the scope of that looks like. Um, but maybe we can have that conversation. Anything else, uh, Rodney? The urban service area for the 51 West development area that will be back on in April. And there again, there was a lot of information in there. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot Rodney an email and, and we'll try to get you some answers. And was that it? All right, I entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Second. All right, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, that motion carries. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Matt and Rachel. Thank, thank you. Bye, right, everybody. everybody. Thank you.